afternoon and welcome. Thank you all for joining. It is great to, to have you with us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Kobe Klar and I'm a citizen of the United Homa Nation. I serve as Executive Committee Liaison and Policy Associate with NCAI and have been part of the team overseeing the development of this important project. It is my honor to introduce today this third webinar in our four-part webinar series, which launches NCAI's groundbreaking Why Native Small Businesses Matter and How to Grow Them animated video series. This series of three short videos is designed to educate current and future tribal leaders, key decision makers, citizens, other Indian country stakeholders, and non-Native policymakers about the vital importance of Native-owned small businesses to the rebuilding of vibrant Native economies and how tribal governments can best support the cultivation of a vibrant small business ecosystem in and around tribal lands. In our webinar today, we will share two leading approaches by tribal nations for methodically developing a multifaceted and vibrant ecosystem capable of fostering Native-owned small business development and growth. With that in mind, we are honored to have with us today James Bible and Rayanne Adams. James Bible serves as president of CSKT Sovereign Leasing and Financing and as general manage, manager of Salish and Kootenai Business Services with the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes in Montana. In these roles, James holds the responsibility for overseeing the overall direction and management of the day-to-day -day business operations of the two entities. Rayanne Adams serves as acting director of economic development for the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe she previously served as community planner for the tribe's Office of Economic Development and is the project director of EDA's Indigenous Communities Akwazasni Tourism Business Support Project. Rayanne leads the tribe's comprehensive economic development, strategic planning, tourism infrastructure development, and small business incubation and innovation projects. James and Rayanne each play instrumental roles in their tribe's small business development approaches which are each featured in NCAI's new Building Tribal Economies Toolkit, which should be being shared in the chat shortly. Uh, with that, I will turn us over to Dr. Ian Record, who will be the moderator for today's session, uh, and will introduce the, the videos as we play them for you all. Dr. Record, please take us away. Thank you, Kobe. Appreciate it. And yes, I just placed in the chat the uh, Building Tribal Economies Toolkit, which was formally released at NCI's annual convention uh, back in November of last year. And uh, and it's my honor to um, share both the toolkit and these this video series, which has been a um, a, a joint project of NCI's for a very long time. Um, as some of you may know, um, before I became a consultant uh, to Nat Native nations and organizations, I worked for seven years with the National Congress of American Indians, working very closely with Kobe Clar and others that were um, attached to the um, NCAI Partnership for Tribal Governance. And that the role of that arm of NCAI has long been to produce um, educational and inf informational resources that help tribal nations strengthen their governance systems strengthen their ability to um, achieve their community economic uh, and related goals. And so, um, you know, it's interesting. We had we had actually secured grant funding for the animated video series um, prior to COVID and had just started working on designing out the, uh, the what has now become three animated videos. Uh, and um, and then COVID hit and um, our, our attentions were turned elsewhere to make sure that any country had everything it needed to uh, recover and and emerge from the pandemic uh, stronger than they were before. And um, the the goal with this animated video series is to um, share messages that have long been coming out of Indian country, long been shared between those in Indian country, that for Native nations to rebuild thriving economies, they need to recenter, revitalize, um, their long-standing traditions of entrepreneurship, the, the the role of the entrepreneur in Native life, um, and do so um, through uh, actions taken by tribal government, but actions also taken by others, and, and ideally in coordination. And so what we wanted to do was tell the story of how uh, Native entrepreneurship, 
Native small businesses have always played an integral role in the in thriving uh, Native economies and, and thriving Native societies. And that for, for Native communities to get back to that place again, they have to consciously work to uh, revive and cultivate uh, businesses owned and operated by their own people. And so this three-part series uh, goes through you know, it starts with traditional native economies, how they how they work traditionally, the, the importance that they placed on stimulating and growing local and intertribal systems of commerce, and how in the second video, those were then, um, those systems were disrupted in very, very um, uh, specific and precise ways by colonial policies that were meant to extract um, resources of value from native communities. And then the third video um, provides an overview of the movement that is growing across any country to recenter, as I said, uh, small business development in native economies and offers, uh, I think it's 17 total strategies that we have seen in our research as commonly effective in doing that. Um, and so we're gonna play these three videos and after that we'll turn to our panel uh, and so, Kobe, I'll turn it, the floor over to you to share the videos, and I'll stop sharing my uh, end here. Thank you, Ian. Here we go with video one. What is a Native economy? It's the constellation of self-governed economic activities a Native people choose to do together in accordance with their cultural, social, ecological, and political values and institutions. The goal of a Native economy is to nourish and sustain that people's distinct sense of identity, belonging, place, balance, and relationships with one another and the natural world, enabling them to flourish on their own terms. Since time immemorial, Native peoples have flourished through their sacred design and maintenance of sophisticated, adaptive economies, often in the face of harsh conditions and changing circumstances. At the heart of a Native economic life were robust local and intertribal systems of commerce. Everyone in the community contributed to these systems, male and female, young and old, leaders and followers. Rigorous training practices equipped individuals and groups with specialized knowledge and skills to make those contributions. These training practices also instilled the value of reciprocity, the profound obligation to play their designated roles, and a deep understanding of how community members' well-being relied on the contributions of others. They were basket weavers, food harvesters, canoe carvers, fishers, tool makers, large and small game hunters, hide tanners, corn growers, and the list goes on and on. Called social entrepreneurs today, they were resourceful and tireless. The community counted on them to sustainably produce and provide vital goods and services that promoted the common good, not just for today, but for generations to come. Traditionally, Native peoples also embraced a deep abiding commitment to recirculate these economic resources as many times as possible. They did this within the community through gifting and exchange, and beyond through wide-ranging trade networks with other Native peoples. They understood from long experience that by prioritizing this interdependence, or as some people call it, the multiplier effect, they would maximize long-lasting benefits of their economic contributions so all community members could flourish. So that was video one and Kobe's queuing up video two here. Here we go. Thank you. 
colonialism turned native economies upside down. It decimated native governance institutions and trade networks and severed native peoples from the places they depended on for their sustenance. Instead of prioritizing regenerative activities that cultivated, circulated, and grew local economic resources within and between native communities, colonial policies and institutions extracted economic resources from native communities for the benefit of dominant society. They did this until those resources were diminished or destroyed. A native community's livelihood once depended on everyone in the community doing their part. But now, economic development involved only the few tribal leaders and citizens who were needed to secure the removal of resources from native lands for the benefit of non-natives. The economic health of native communities was no longer determined by native agency and production but rather by outside market forces and the ulterior motives of states, Congress, the administration, and the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, native social entrepreneurs, once the wellspring of native prosperity, were actively excluded from this new economic equation. The devastating effects of this systematic suppression of native economies endure today, including Tribal economic strategies that focus only on launching large businesses that the tribal nation can own and operate, increasing federal funding to support community members, and attracting outside investors to the community. Limited opportunities for community members to play the valued economic roles they once did, which has made some people dependent on the government for their welfare, and prompted others to take their talents elsewhere, a dynamic known as brain drain. Widespread disregard for native entrepreneurs as an economic force, leaving them little access to the infrastructure, resources, and technical assistance needed to start and grow businesses in native communities, and driving those who do largely underground. Weak local systems of commerce with few places for community members to get what they need, forcing them to venture outside of the community to do so. Severe economic leakage, where the financial resources a Native community has immediately leaves it before it can recirculate, greatly weakening their power to bring lasting benefits to the entire community. Limited community understanding of and appreciation for the core cultural value of doing business with one's fellow community members and Native communities that are economically isolated from one another with little, if any, trade between them. Overall, the systematic suppression of Native economies has left Native communities with limited ability to foster self-determined economic growth and long-term community prosperity. All right, that was video two, and last but not least, video three, which hopefully will leave you energized and uplifted and ready to figure out how to implement some of these great strategies that other Native nations have have developed through their own um, through their own solutions. Over the past several decades, a self determination renaissance has swept across Indian country. Tribal nations are uprooting the oppressive colonial policies and institutions that have greatly harmed their communities by once again seizing the reins of self-governance. In the process, they are rebuilding native economies that enact their cultural values and long-range visions for a vibrant future. For a growing number, this means reconnecting with their age-old entrepreneurial spirit by making the cultivation of local small businesses owned by tribal citizens a central foundation of their efforts to revitalize tribal systems of commerce and foster sustainable economic growth on their own terms. These nations are forging blueprints for success, featuring effective strategies that are proving useful for other tribal nations. These include 
Implementing a trauma-informed plan to help tribal citizens heal and become prepared to play the roles that revitalizing the tribal nation's economy require. Codifying a comprehensive small business development initiative in the nation's economy rebuilding approach and dedicating the financial and human resources it needs to take root and grow. Defining the distinct type of businesses the nation and its citizens should own and how the citizen-owned businesses can help meet the community's needs. Assessing the current state of the nation's economy, including the severity of economic leakage from the community, how to stem that leakage by working with native entrepreneurs, and the nation's capacity to build a thriving citizen-owned business ecosystem. Creating a robust system of tribal laws to foster citizen-owned business development and growth like a uniform tribal commercial code. Consistently enforcing those laws through an independent and properly resourced judicial mechanism that fairly resolves commercial disputes. Building a culture of accountability to those laws through ongoing tribal leader and staff trainings and community education. Helping citizens launch and grow small businesses through streamlined business licensing, site leasing, and related regulations education, training, and technical assistance, financial assistance, and building the physical and digital infrastructure they need. Providing native entrepreneurs with integrated support like startup and growth capital, training, business plan development, and market feasibility studies through partnerships with native nonprofits, CDFIs, co-ops, tribal colleges and universities, chambers of commerce, small business development centers, and others. Developing an economic profile that documents the skills and interests of the tribal workforce, the citizen-owned small businesses in the community, tribal and regional market forecasting, and how the citizen-owned business community can evolve to meet future market needs. Creating a procurement policy requiring that tribal government and tribal enterprises do business with certified citizen-owned businesses first and other native-owned businesses second, and helping those businesses become certified. Launching a permanent Buy Native campaign so that everyone understands the financial, social, and cultural benefits citizen-owned businesses provide. Promoting local citizen-owned businesses to other native communities, the surrounding region, and the world. Modestly taxing citizen-owned businesses and reinvesting that revenue in their growth through loans, marketing, training, and technical assistance. Holding the federal government accountable to its trust and treaty obligations to fund native small businesses and engaging state governments and philanthropic partners to do the same. Learning from the innovations of other tribal nations to strengthen the nation's development of a healthy ecosystem for citizen-owned businesses. And celebrating successful citizen-owned businesses within the community and beyond. When tribal nations embrace these strategies, they nurture a vibrant economy producing a multitude of benefits, including more local jobs, keeping more dollars circulating within the community and keeping talented, hardworking tribal citizens at home, a reduced cost of living and an improved quality of community life, the emergence of new role models for native youth, and ultimately, a strong and resilient foundation upon which to flourish as native people once again. Awesome. Thank you, Kobe. So um, I should mention, as you saw there in the closing credits, we had the great fortune of of having the videos narrated by Alice uh, Connick Glenn, who's an Inupiaq um, uh, person from up in Alaska and uh, very, very talented. She does a lot of different media work and 
very fortunate that she lent her talents to our project. And then also wanted to acknowledge James, uh, uh, our panelist James, and also Rand's colleague, uh, James Lazor, um, who were part of a team of about a dozen content contributors. These are folks that are have dedicated their professional careers to um, helping their tribes and other tribes um, figure out this economic development puzzle. And, and as part of that, figuring out how to recenter uh, Native entrepreneurship in that puzzle. So um, without further ado, I did want to turn to our panel now to have them share. And we're going to have James uh, lead us off, and um, he's going to share his own screen and slides and also take you on a short tour of the um, some of the, the uh, activities that they have going on. Um, if you have questions uh, for either of the panelists as they're presenting, please put them in the Q&A uh, box. You'll see the You'll see uh, the Q and A box down at the bottom of your Zoom screen there, and then we'll get to as many questions as we we can during the moderated discussion after they both present. So, without further ado, uh, James, take it away. All right, thank you, Ian. All right, thank you. My name is James Weibel, the president of Sovereign Leasing and Financing and then General Manager of SK Business Services. Um, just a quick brief history over our entity here. Um, SK Holdings is what we originally started as in 1973. And over the years, we've moved into some different names and we landed on Sovereign Leasing and Financing and then overall SK Business Services as it engulfs everything that we do. And a little fun fact that we like to tell people um, who've never heard of our services or our business. Um, is that we started and we gave the loan to SK Gaming here on the reservation to start our gaming enterprise on the reservation. All right, here's a picture of our team. Um, couldn't do anything without these, without these three ladies right here. They are the backbone of our company. Uh, Lisa Stinger, she is our office manager and our general manager of our self storage areas. Um, Sarah Sandoval, she's our business specialist, marketing specialist, email specialist, and Tina Begay, she's our accountant. Um, we operate a few things here, and, and one of them includes a boulder. Boulder, It's our hydropower plant located on the east shore of Flathead Lake here on the CSKT reservation. Um, Boulder, the Boulder Hydro plant generates roughly $70,000 a year um, in revenue for our company. And it's one of the things that helped us become self-sustainable um, as our own entity separate from the tribe. Um, this is a picture of a turbine. The turbine um, generates all the power that we store and sell to our local power company that the tribe owns. Um, Self-storage, um, our current units, these are our older units pictured. Um, this is another arm of s &K Business Services that's helped us become self-sufficient, you know, self -sufficient, self-sustainable. Um, so our, our, our newer units were built in 2017, 160 units um, with each unit uh, available right here in the size and the monthly rent. And then last year, um, we had an expansion of units of 90 units uh, based on the need. Um, after COVID, a lot of people moved in the area and a lot of people didn't have anywhere to store their, their belongings. And so it was up to us to, you know, expand our services and fit the need for the reservation. Um, here's a picture of our newer units, same color, same layout as the, the previous pictures, um, but building F on the left has 44 units, building E on the right holds 46 units. On the property, um, on the compound, we also have and rent out two warehouses. Um, they're 2,400 square foot each, and they are long-term leases. Um, one of the gentlemen that rent, rents the unit from us, he is an auto mechanic and a body repair shop. And we have biofuels uh, located on the property. They recycle plant-based oils for businesses located on the reservation. And that's just about every business that has a deep fryer, every restaurant on the reservation that has a deep fryer, their oil comes to our location, gets recycled and shipped out to uh, Missoula, Montana. 
I'll just say, let's include the business services. Um, we offer an, an array of business services here. Um, our services include business development, technical assistance, computer and technology access, and a fully functional office available to all tribal members. We also manage and run um, free online entrepreneurship classes to all entrepreneurs located in the 72 mile stretch of highway um, off of Highway 93 here, um, ranging from Missoula, Montana to Kalispell, Montana. Primarily focused um, towards tribal members but you do not have to be a tribal member to attend any of our classes. Um, those classes include financial literacy, home buyers education, ethical tourism, digital marketing, and empowerment workshops. Um, on the empowerment workshops, um, there's different topics each year. Um, last year, we had people um, bring their own business plans, and divide them in groups. Um, they managed and operated their own business for uh, we simulated for like 365 days within within this workshop, but it was all compiled into three days. And then you solved operational issues for this business, as well as broke off into separate groups in the afternoon to work on your own business plan to get help from other entrepreneurs, either in the area or those entrepreneurs that were on Zoom. Um, we are an incubator for the CSKT tribe and the reservation. So we offer startup assistance, um, economic development, and this is primarily focused on tribal members um, based on where in their underserved community based on the surroundings here. But you do not have to be a tribal member to use our services. And just here's a here's a quick snapshot of the courses we have over the year um, and ending in March. Um, ethical tourism, uh, we've had we have once a month. And I'm sorry, that's not up here, but we are still defining those dates as the first one isn't until February. So if any of you would like to join, feel free to contact me and you can hop on one of these classes or just a quick refresher for your employees or yourself if you're entrepreneurs. Uh, sovereign lease and financing, the services we offer are micro loans, business loans, lines of credit, and equipment leases to individuals and businesses. Uh, the current leases we have are three, one to safety of dams and one to our property and supply um, located on the reservation. The current loans, 18 business loans, and 15 of those are tribal member owned business loans. SKBS and sovereign leasing, uh, we do a lot of work and we receive a lot of funding here, which helps us also become self-sustainable. And here's a list of grants that we get yearly, um, the partnership planning grant. And I am also, um, that, and I meant to mention is I am the planner for the CSKT tribe and CSKT reservation. Uh, we get the NABA grant, the Native American Business Advisor grant. And that grant allows us to put on those free classes and entrepreneurship classes for the reservation and the surrounding areas. Um, potential grants that we're going to apply for, and this is going to help us update our Boulder Hydro plant, is the USDA Energy and Mineral Grants. Um, they close uh, the end of this year. Um, in the future, um, we plan on becoming a native CDFI. And we do a lot of in-kind work. Um, we donate to the First Responders Sheriff Association and local groups located on the reservation. And we also donate our office and our time to the Native American Development Corporation based out of Billings. And one more share, I would like to share the Indian Preference Office face our website. Give me a second. And so what our Indian Preference website hosts, um, can everyone see that? Okay. On the Indian Preference Office, so CSKT and our entity, SNK Business Services, work hand in hand economic development um, to provide to all entrepreneurs and businesses on the reservation. And this, this didn't happen overnight. Um, Indian Preference Office started in 2009, and we just began building from there. So to the left, um, to the left, you see all of the business listings. Um, spread out into two into all their their separate fields. Um, so if anyone, any contractor, any individual 
Um, any entrepreneur that wanted to start a business, you can kind of see your competition, where to buy from, where to order from, where to get bids from, all listed to the left here. And it goes all the way from seasonal to those who are in catering for food, yearly, summer tourism. We have everything listed on here. And there's the website contact information, but just to sum it up on um, local businesses or entrepreneurs, download this business application. We help them here, they turn it in, they get a license to operate on the CSKT reservation for one year, and then it's renewed after one year, and then the cycle repeats. like to thank you all for giving me this time to present to you um, any questions so we'll, we'll um we, we don't have any questions in the in the box yet and um we'll we'll get to audience questions after Rayanne presents but I did want to I did want to ask you to um share a little bit more detail on uh on a couple of things one is the tribe's procurement policy and how it requires uh tribal government and tribal enterprise to do business with those licensed uh, vendors, uh, native owned small businesses that you mentioned. Um, and then also if you can shed a little bit more light on on the the step you guys took to help uh, some of your entrepreneurs be competitive for those tribal government contracts, tribal enterprise contracts through the leasing of equipment and tools. Yes, yeah, so the, uh, we'll start in the procurement process. Um, all of our processes, especially if you are within the tribe or you're a tribal member um, wanting to build anything or start a business and you need contract work, um, you have to have three bids and it, three and at least one. One of those has to be a CSKT entity or a CSKT tribal member on the reservation. And then as for the, the leasing of equipment, can you, can you walk through that is how that's helped um, some of your entrepreneurs be competitive for uh, tribal government enterprise contracts that they otherwise wouldn't be? Um, yes. Um, so what we were really proud of this program and it started, it, we've always done it, but we've hit it heavy in the last two years. Um, we've partnered with a lot of contractors on the reservation and we've leased equipment to them at lower rates than they would normally get in order to get traction within the network of contractors located on this reservation. And we lease anything from computers, printers, all the way up to heavy machinery to these contractors. And then we also have a, a program in partnership with Salish Kootenai Housing Authority located right, right down the highway who provides housing for tribal members on the reservation um, with their contractors um, who normally wouldn't be able to win bids. They would be a subcontractor of the bid winner and we've helped them apply for and win bids um, by paying for their materials out of our office. So materials is the heavy cost. And you know, in the past two years, they I believe they had 98 houses of, of vacant on the reservation. And you know, housing is in crisis, not just in the United States, but you know, on every reservation in America, um, more focused. And so, um, in the past two years, we've helped contractors. Um, win bids and service these houses and get them fixed up in a timely manner and a lot quicker than the, the bigger contractors would because these contractors are local and we've gotten it down to, I believe, 62 houses. And so roughly 30 houses they've been able to work on in the past two years. That's great. And so you you provide them the, for those kinds of uh, jobs, the licensed uh, businesses, you know, um, at CSKT, they, they, uh, you provide them the materials up front and then and then they reimburse you once they get paid for the job. Is that how it works? Yes, yes. Um, and it's also backed by the housing authority. The housing authority um, pretty much grants them a line of credit and then we partnership and give them the money. As soon as CSKT releases the, or the SNK housing releases the funds to them, they pay us and then they get the remaining balance. Kind of, kind of, it guides the first, the first time contractors, you know, hand in hand all the way from A to Z, and then shows them how to bid, um, train them on how to bid, how to write proposals, how to help their cash flow, balance their, you know, checkbook, debit, credit, and things like that. And, you know, 
get them on the road to being fully self-sufficient and self-sustainable and not having to get loans. They have enough cash flow to get them either to the next job or the next three jobs or no more, no more need for, you know, a bank or us anymore, which is, you know, the primary objective. That's great. So um, thank you for that, James. Um, we're going to turn it now to uh, Rayanne. Uh, so let me pull up the her presentation. And Rayanne, as I mentioned, if you if you um, just just uh, let me know next slide, please, when you're ready, and the floor is yours. Sure. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Sego, everybody. My name is uh, Rayanne Adams. I'm the acting director of economic development for the Saint Regis Mohawk Tribes and um, overseeing Akwazasne Travel as the project director. Um, you can go to the next slide. Akwazasne Travel is the cultural tourism division under the Office of Economic Development. Uh, we're nearly 15 years uh, in the making. As you can see, I always like to put this up to um, allow our audience to know where we started. Uh, first identified in 2009 in a comprehensive uh, community development plan as uh, economic diversification, um, a strategy and a plan that kind of derived, uh, identified, sorry, tourism as a means to diversify our economy uh, from our large enterprises and our tribal gaming enterprises. So um, tourism was two-pronged approach in our community. First, it served as uh, cultural preservation, first and foremost, but also provided an, an opportunity to uh, develop small businesses, uh, particularly around our artisan community, uh, which we have a large contingent of. Um, we utilize tourism as a means to create um, sustainability and employment, but also um, cultural preservation in a way that educates uh, informs our visitors um, who we are, uh, where we come from, and how our way of life is influenced in all the things that we do in Akwazasne. Um, and then since then, it's it's grown tremendously. Uh, we were able to um, create strategic action plans, uh, more comprehensive on assessing the needs throughout the community in terms of capacity. Uh, infrastructure development, how to support a growing tourism industry, and what are those business needs uh, and services that are going to be required of our office. Uh, you can go to the next slide. In this endeavor, uh, we weren't able to do that alone. This was uh, community-wide, so we did extensive engagement, uh, including representatives from our large organizations throughout the community, including the northern portion of our territory. Uh, if you are not familiar with Akwazasne, we are um, located in New York State, Ontario, and Quebec, Canada. So our territory expands the international border. We have two governing bodies, the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe on the south and the Mohawk um, Council of Akwazasne to the north. And so together, we enlisted representatives from each of these large organizations to really develop a comprehensive uh, tourism plan, um, how it works on both sides of the border, how it services each one of our community members, um, the reasoning uh, for economic diversification, but also uh, cultural preservation. You can go to the next slide. And so all together, we created uh, a vision and a mission statement. Uh, we are a proud community sharing world-class tourism experiences that celebrate our environment, heritage, and language. Our guiding principles, uh, this is across all of these organizations. Like I said, it's a collective uh, initiative where we're not able to succeed individually. We must have buy-in from all of our organizations and our community members to make sure that this is successful and sustainable uh, for future generations. Uh, next slide. So under the Office of Economic Development, we were able to uh, receive uh, a grant to support a dedicated team through the Administration for Native Americans. 
we received a five-year award uh, to develop a destination marketing and management organization. So a body that could uh, fill the capacity needs of promoting and marketing uh, Alquizasni as a destination, while also creating uh, custom curriculums that are tailored to our community specifically in terms of business development and tourism development training. We are able to offer uh, technical assistance, uh, small business support, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So each client that we receive is uh, very unique. So depending on uh, geography, um, household, education, uh, whatever um, uniqueness it may be, we're able to serve them in a way that is uh, meaningful, but also appropriate. Um, so we were able to develop uh, an, an interpretive plan, a historical research report, uh, we offer interpretive guide training um, and a tourism basic infrastructure plan, which really looks at uh, the community as a whole and identifies the gaps uh, in infrastructure and where we can go uh, to develop that in the future. So looking at uh, incoming visitors, you know, the size of the guests group, uh, what we can accommodate, what we can't accommodate, the environmental impacts of these groups um, and cultural guidelines and protocols. What do we share? What do we not share? Um, so we were able to use this as an opportunity uh, for self-determination, you know, what it works for us specifically, um, but also because we don't have a guide to follow, we were the very first to do it in Akwazasni. Uh, it's taking us a lot of time to get off the ground, but we were successfully launched in 2021, uh, right after the pandemic, which uh, in turn became a uh, resiliency planning. So instead of, um, you know, having to scrap the project and the years of work that we built up to get here, uh, we just figured out different ways to make it work for us. And so changing um, our market demographics from uh, foreign independent travelers, which we were targeting through travel trade, uh, we decided to look towards uh, regional visitors, you know, our our backyard neighbors is what they call them, who can travel a days um, in a day to come visit us. And I mean, as a Native community, I, I think we underestimate the impact from our neighbors, the economic impact. Um, they don't often come visit our community and understand uh, from a cultural or educational um element, you know, who we are and, and what we're about. And I think there's, there's opportunity there. So that's what we're looking to develop more. But also, uh, we want to provide our artists, our traditional um, knowledge holders, the opportunity to diversify and create business opportunities through their art. And so we relied heavily on um, on cultivating those group of individuals to build unique experiences. So they're able to turn their art into um, more of a sustainable, uh, a living wage and investment into themselves and into their business. Now uh, you can go to the next slide. So we do extensive community engagement uh, looking for ways to expand the tourism network, but also the industry here in Akwazasne. And like I said, we don't do that alone. Uh, we invite a lot of uh, organization stakeholders, a lot of community members to participate um, because we're the service provider. They are the ones that are going to be um, initiating the practice. We're here to support them. Uh, we offer uh, event planning and uh, we do a large event actually in the summer, which is going to be turning into a premier highlight for the North Country. Uh, we do a Akwazasne Art Market and Juried Show. We're entering our third year. We had over 80 participants, over 80 artisans locally from Akwazasne participate um, at a competition level Juried Show. We also encourage other uh, cultural and traditional knowledge holders um, 
to utilize our resources because the stronger we can build our network, um, the more sustainable it is. So we're able to market Akwazesne as a destination, a place to explore and learn and really um, encompass uh, Mohawk culture here. Next slide. So these are just uh, some of the experiences that we currently offer at Akwazesne Travel. Uh, we are onboarding a few additional um, experiences as well. All of our booking is done through our office, uh, which is a need that we identified through a lot of our engagement. Um, our local community doesn't have the capacity to be the administrative arm um, and the maker. So we were able to expand our role within our office to be that service provider. So we do the marketing, the promotion, the advertising. Uh, we initiate the conversation through sales uh, with potential visitors and tour operators. We do the booking, the transaction, the scheduling, um, and the billing. So all of that gets filtered through our office so we can just communicate with the artisan um, if they are available to host a group uh, on a particular day. We facilitate the um, guided um, we facilitate the guides, uh, visitors to the studio or to the place, and then back again, uh, which is important because our community uh, was really vocal about um, not having visitors in, in highly residential areas. So again, uh, following along those guidelines and those protocols, uh, we, we take all of this information and feedback into consideration when executing a tour. And then we continually refine the experience with the business owner and then utilize our resources and economic development to strengthen that, that business. So we are able to offer financial assistance specifically to our tourism network uh, beyond what we offer currently in economic development. So we were able to create that specifically for this group. And I think that makes them feel um, more willing to to be included and be a part of this uh, growing industry. And we're hoping that it, um, you know, it encourages others to be part of uh, this network. You can go to the next slide. So Akwazasne Travel is community-based. Uh, we are a destination marketing and management organization. And as mentioned, uh, we are a component of a collective and continuous effort to preserve, restore our culture and build a healthy economy. And so through tourism, we're able to offer uh, unique and diverse economic opportunities um, that has led us to looking at infrastructure development projects. So there is no, um, <laughs> there, there are such expansive ways to introduce new elements of tourism that we haven't got to yet. And it really, uh, really solidifies the need for this type of programming in a, in a tribal economy. Uh, we're able to look at our placemaking abilities, um, how to develop infrastructure improvement projects, uh, not, the, not just with the tribe, but with the small businesses in our community and um, our partner organizations. Um, how are they able to do business better and not just internally, but externally, externally with other uh, stakeholders. And so we really leveraged our partnerships um, among tribal administrators, but other tourism organizations such as uh, New York State Tourism Industry Association and AONTA. Um, American Indian Alaska Native Tourism Organization. And then also with our state and federal agencies and those um, individuals who are becoming our partners because uh, we've worked very hard to cultivate those relationships with these organizations. Uh, and so when we submit grant applications or project applications, they're very familiar with the work that we're doing here. And uh, we keep them um, informed as much as possible so that we remain competitive. Um, but they also understand that uh, some of the language that we put in these applications are based on our uniqueness of our geography, of our service base, um, and how we as tribal administrators need to provide those unique services um, to our membership. So we are not um, like 
you know, municipalities or towns or counties. So we're very different. And I think through tourism, we were able to communicate that effectively uh, with our internal and external stakeholders. And that's all I have today, Ian. Thank you so much, Ray. I appreciate it. Um, I know we have a couple questions in the queue. I did want to ask you a couple follow-ups. Um, you mentioned the towards the end of your remarks, the the New York State Tourism Board, I believe, or authority. And I believe you, you have a you have a, a, a formal role with that entity. Is that am I correct in that? Yes. Uh, so I serve on the sustainability task force. Um, we, you know, we talk a lot about sustainable tourism initiatives, and uh, we're because of uh, you know our relationship and our land based uh, learning and our traditional ecological knowledge. Um, everything we do in tourism in Aquasasne is sustainable. It comes from um, our traditional practices, you know, our land based teachings. Um, we're just trying to emphasize the work that we're already doing here. And so we're able to organize and formulate tourism in a way that just complements what has been done for centuries. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and I, I've heard I've heard this from you and, and others that the importance of of um, folks in your line of work that are working to support uh, tribal economy building uh, native entrepreneurs is to get get out beyond the uh, your community and make sure that others understand um, that that you exist, that your entrepreneurs exist, and that that you ought to be part of their efforts to promote uh, economy throughout the state. Um, you know how important has that been for you in your role to to be that voice for your community in that in that statewide uh, body? Oh, it's very important. Uh, when we go to these annual meetings or conferences, uh, you know, we're one of maybe two tribal representatives, you know, in the entire room. Uh, so for them to understand that, you know, we can have um, the same things that they have on a different scale, maybe uh, for a different reason, um, it's important because we're, you know, buying into memberships, we're taking advantage of their resources. And so the more we can talk about our projects, uh, the more inclined they are to include us in initiatives they have moving forward. And so we're able to start piggybacking now off of um, their resources, you know, whether it's technical assistance or just relationship building or being in those rooms where decisions are made on how allocations are developed. Is, is important as well. What's always intrigued me about, about your approach is, is like, like many, many other similar entities across any country, you guys work to market your entrepreneurs uh, beyond reservation boundaries. But what, I, what, what I, what's, all, what's always been struck by is um, how thoughtful you've been in, in bringing the market to the doorstep of your entrepreneurs. Um, it's one thing, you know, to market, um, you know, our, an artist's wares uh, virtually on online through, a you know, an online marketplace. It's another to bring folks from outside the community into your community and connect them directly with. You guys take out all of that challenge of of your entrepreneur engaging with that market or going to find that market and then and then connecting with you. You you do a lot of that foundational work for them. Um, and, and I know that it, I think it was in 2022, you guys launched a new program to uh, support the development of more entrepreneurs in your community. Can you can you wrap up by sharing just a little bit about that about that new initiative? Sure. Uh, we were funded through um, EDA Indigenous Communities for tourism business support, uh, which really allowed us to expand our services um, as a service provider. Uh, more detailed, as I mentioned, like almost like a case study basis. We receive, uh, you know. A, a feedback uh, application to submit. Um, and we intake this individual, assess their business, where they are currently, where they want to be, what are their goals. Uh, and we help build um, this work plan with them. And so at the end of the work plan, uh, as they're going through the training and the curriculums that we've built, they're able to receive um, a startup uh, funding in order to, whether it's uh, explore tourism uh, business expansion or to strengthen their existing tourism um, idea. 
And so we've been really successful in, in that we were able to, I think, uh, just graduate maybe four or five individuals uh, who are starting and who will be online actually in the next few months. Uh, so we're really excited to expand um, our experiences uh, nationally and internationally. So we're we're really excited about that. Thank you for that. Um, so I want to open it up now for our uh, Q and A session, um, and we have a couple in the queue, and and invite others who um, may have questions now that both have presented to uh, also add questions to the chat, but. I, I think this first one is for you, James. Um, those classes that you mentioned um, uh, early on in your presentation that you offer, um, uh, are those in only in person? Uh, are, are they virtual? Are they some combination of the two? Um, they're, they're, they're a combination of two. If you would like to come in person, um, you can sit in our, our office space here and take them, but we primarily see our attendees on Zoom. And then I forgot to mention with our courses, you also get a continuing education credit um, with the local college here, Salish and Kuki College, you get a continuing education credit uh, for attending each class. Yeah, that's great. I, I'm a, I've, I've known of Sales Kootenai College for a long time, and I know that they've they've done a wonderful job of, of connecting in with these kinds of training opportunities and extending those CEUs, which are really important for ongoing professional development and obtaining additional degrees and certifications. Um, so we have a question from Beth. Um, says, I love what you guys are doing in the entrepreneur, sp entre entrepreneur space. Um, what do you typically are seeing in terms of the timing from when a um from from when a, uh, somebody comes to you with a business idea to when they actually launch their business? I I recognize there's variation with uh, there, but but among the folks that you support, what do you what are you commonly seeing as sort of the, the usual time frame that it takes them to go from idea to reality. Yeah. Um, well, you kind of summed it up right there. We, we do get a variety of things. We got people who come in with already done business plans. Um, we got people who just come in with, with an idea and everyone in between. And so right now we got an average of about 42 days. Um, if you don't come in with an already set business plan, if you come in with an idea, you know, we start from day one, we give you some homework. Um, as far as business plan template goes, um, you can even borrow a computer from us, um, rent a computer out and take it home, or you you're feel free to use the office to finish it. Um, but then roughly 42 days. Um, but we are seeing things move a lot quicker. Um, we recently partnered with a company called SynCurrent. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of SynCurrent. Um, it's an AI-based technology um, business plan application, and they partnered with CSKT um, to bring that to the reservation. And so we've seen, you know, quicker time frames. I think the quickest one right now is eight days. And so the application, you download the app on your phone or you set up a membership online, um, and it's free for tribal members. It, there's a there's a small fee if you're a non-tribal member, but there's a fee for tribal. There's non there's no fee for tribal members. Excuse me. There's no fee for tribal members. All you need is your first last name and your tribal ID and you sign up and you get, you get the fee waived. And then it starts you off with what's your idea? Um, simple questions. It's AI based. Um, what's your idea? What do you want to sell? Where are you at marketing? Where are you at in finances? Um, have you made it sold any units? Um, and all the questions in between that build up to making your business plan. And then at the end of the application, and if you have everything written down on paper, um, it should take you about three and a half hours to get through all the questions. And then it it emails you a business plan with everything, everything you need on it. And you bring it to us or you can email it to us. And we, you know, finish some things that the AI component can't do. And then you're ready to go. You're ready to apply at a bank. You're ready to apply with us. Um, tribal credit here. Um, and so we're seeing things speed up with that partnership. That's fantastic. Um, there's a lot of things I don't like about AI, but that sounds like a positive thing about AI. Um, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of give and take, and it was my it was my option to not include those things that they they can come in and get help from a real person from. Yeah, that's that's a good balance to strike. How about how about you, Rianne? Um, what are you seeing in, in the work that you're doing supporting your entrepreneurs? Uh, very similar. It it really depends on the readiness of the individual. Um, you know, it depends on the commitment as well. Uh, we have a lot of individuals or members who 
um, maybe current business owners who are looking to diversify, whether it's new service or product, or just, you know, who already have a job who are looking to start a business. So there's uh, a number of different situations. Everyone is uh, unique. Uh, our programming, though, we work with um, our local SBDC, uh, Small Business Development Center. We have a dedicated business advisor who visits Akwazasne to um, help our members uh, develop their business plans, but also if they're in need of certain certifications or recommendations on next steps, uh, they can go through that uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. But typically, uh, our programming within tourism uh, we're able to, uh, again, depending on um, commitment, we're able to get somebody uh, certified and through our process within, you know, six to eight weeks. That's great. It's a far cry from from what I what I used to hear um, would happen across tribes, particularly when, you know, what I haven't heard once today is either one of you guys mentioned the BIA. Um, which is a good thing, because I know back in the day it was, you know, you'd have to go through this whole process and then somebody from the BA would have to sign off an approval of a of a business license or something like that. And you just don't hear that anymore because tribes have have t taken the steps you need to take to remove the feds from from these kinds of tr uh, what should be tribal processes, exclusively tribal processes. Um, so another question and, um, you know, the the third video mentions um, among the strategies that a growing number of tribes, including CSKT and, and, and St. Regis Mohawk, um, have developed procurement policies. And typically those policies will uh, have a, uh, a preference um, in, in embedded within it where um, if it's for tribal government contracts or tribal government and tribal enterprise contracts, that uh, preference one goes to um, businesses owned and operated by individual members or citizens of that tribe. And then secondarily, other Native people. And so the question is kind of along that vein, but it says, are there policies being considered to accept Indian-owned business certification from other tribes so small business owners don't have to start from scratch with each tribe they are wanting to do business with? So, um, so James, I, I, to the degree you know, can you share, um, start with you, can you share, um, how does that work? So you have a you have a, a native entrepreneur who's not a CSKT member, but they're they're you know maybe enrolled with another tribe. They wanna they wanna become a licensed uh, vendor with CSKT. What's that? Where what's the process? Who do they go to? How do they you know what's involved? So in in our processes, it is a CSKT membership first, and then other other members of other tribes second, and then non members get the third. The third level after that and so you can still um to my to my understanding you could still apply for a license with the tribe to be considered indian preference not cskt preference so you hit that second preference um i guess benchmark and then you're able to do business on the reservation yeah thank you and Rand, did you have anything to add on this question no we have a very uh, similar policy so it is a native preference uh, Coming in second, primarily though, with our programming, uh, we look to hire individuals of, within our community. So they are membership um, because we feel that, you know, that's part of the creating jobs um, and employment opportunities is we need to satisfy that locally first before we engage in any um, RFP off territory, but it would be native policy preference and then anyone up. Anyone else could be considered. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, I think that's be, become pretty standard among across tribes um, who have procurement policies that that cover uh, some combination of tribal government and tribal enterprise. I know um, some tribal procurement policies are limited to tribal government only. Some um, cover both tribal government and tribal enterprise, um, and and some some extend to others doing business on tribal lands that they have to, um, you know, sort of tarot, but for business as opposed to um, you know, tarot for employment. Uh, so I, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I, I think we can go ahead and wrap up. Really appreciate uh, the both of you taking time out of your busy schedules to share with us today. Uh, I've heard both of you share uh, about your approaches. 
uh, multiple times now, and I'm, and I always learn something new, and it's uh, it's it's really a joy to see how how quickly your efforts are expanding um, as you you know uh, as you learn from live experience and and um, the the experiences of your entrepreneurs and and figure out how to grow what what it is you're doing and and modeling it honestly for other tribes. So um, I did want to just flag again that both of these stories are featured in NCI's Building Tribal Economies Toolkit, which we put in the chat. Uh, at the beginning of the um, webinar here today. Uh, Kobe and the NCI team are working to uh, launch the uh, Building Tribal Economies Toolkit Resource Center, uh, which will be, I think, coming online uh, sometime next month. And so we'll be sharing out with all of you um, that that news when it when it goes live. And you can, um, and you can uh, learn a lot more about the issues that have been shared today and the solutions that have been shared today. Um, and I did want to wrap up by just um, reminding folks, I believe everyone here should um, everyone here should uh, already be registered for our final webinar in our four part series, uh, which is this Thursday, February 1st. And it's also at 3 p.m. Eastern. And we're going to be hearing from uh, Lakota Vogel, who runs uh, Four Bands, uh, which is a native CDFI in South Dakota. And then also uh, Pamela Standing who uh, runs the Minnesota Indian Business Alliance to talk about the role of uh, partners, uh, partners to tribal governments in building these strong ecosystems for native small businesses to flourish. And so, um, so uh, we encourage you to attend that, share, share that information, uh, the registration information with your uh, colleagues and, um, and we will see everyone on Thursday. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Kobe to wrap us up. Thank you, Ian. Not much to add, just again, sincere thank you to, first of all, to Dr. Record for, for moderating today's session and to Rayanne and James for uh, obviously the, the important and valuable work that they do in their communities and beyond and for, for taking time out of their days to share that work, a little bit of that work with us today. Um, and hope all of you can join us for the final webinar on Thursday. Thank you all.